Of all of Japan's media exports, there is none so immediately recognizable as anime. The name itself is a shortening of the English word animation, though the moniker of anime implies a certain artistic style and a set of traits. Humans are drawn particularly stylized. Eyes are either large or are simply lines traced across the face. Mouths are drawn wide, and bodily expressions are dynamic and exaggerated. Thin characters are often extremely lithe, while a muscular character may be depicted as absurdly chiseled. Backgrounds and objects, however, are done with a more realistic style, creating a strong dichotomy. Though there are dozens of other style choices typical of anime that may or may not be used, there is one that stays more consistent. Where most other animation styles are created at 24 frames per second, anime is animated at half or less than half of this rate, sometimes dipping as low as 6 frames per second for background animations. This style of animation has its own particular subculture associated with it as well, known as otaku, and their fanaticism is legendary. So who are these people, and how did their favorite style of animation come to be? To answer this, one must look all the way back to Japan during World War II, as well as its relationship to America. By 1945, Japan had been at war with the United States of America for four and a half years, but the might of the US military proved overwhelming. Originally, Emperor Hirohito and his government had sought to secure more of the Pacific by dispensing with America's presence, but for the last two years of the war, the Japanese had suffered nothing but defeats until all that was left were the four islands of Japan. Victory was a hopeless fantasy, and so Hirohito demanded every last man, woman, and child in Japan fight against the invaders and increase the American casualties as much as possible. The intention was to demoralize the Americans out of an invasion and force a more limited surrender, preferably one that left the sovereignty of Hirohito intact. Tentative to charge headlong into the Japanese heartland, the Americans began firebombing cities, where most of the manufacturing for the Japanese military occurred. Japanese buildings were remarkably flammable, and the destruction caused by these bombing campaigns was immense. On top of this, the American Navy had almost entirely destroyed Japan's merchant fleet, wiping out sea-based supply lines. Even with no hope of victory, the Japanese would not surrender, in part due to pride. Japan had never lost a war to a foreign nation on its own turf before. Then, the unthinkable happened. On August 6th, 1945, America dropped the first atomic bomb on Japan in the city of Hiroshima, destroying over two-thirds of the city. Over 70,000 people were killed by the blast and ensuing fire. Even still, Emperor Hirohito and his generals refused to yield, believing that more bombs were outside of the capacity of America, at least for some time longer. Three days later, on August 9th, the Americans dropped a second bomb on Nagasaki, where over 35,000 people were killed immediately. Only then did Hirohito declare a surrender, hoping to barter for his continued reign. This attempt failed. Japan was in a state of ruin. Millions had been left homeless by the firebombing campaigns. Hundreds of thousands were dead, starvation was endemic, and people were afflicted by radiation sickness from the bombs. What's more, the economy of the country had literally sunk with the entire merchant fleet, and the government was destroyed and American occupation was established. Japan's territory outside of the four main islands was invaded and secured by Stalin's forces and claimed for Russia. In a more subjective sense, the Japanese people had lost a large portion of their identity, replaced with images of desolation and despair. In particular, the nuclear bomb had suddenly become a complicated symbol of destruction, pain, and subjugation. While America occupied Japan and worked to establish a working democracy, Japan's culture underwent radical shifts. For a decade before the war, nationalistic art was not only encouraged, but mandated and sponsored by the government, and with the government's support, Japanese-created animation had gone from an unpopular curiosity to a popular phenomenon and powerful propaganda machine. But after the surrender, America saw that all kinds of nationalistic art was restricted. Traditional forms of entertainment, such as theater and bundaku puppetry, declined in popularity and, in some cases like kabuki, the practices were banned entirely for the duration of the occupation. 
With no economy to sustain it, the artistic scene in Japan had largely dissolved. However, there was one Japanese storytelling tradition that saw a surge in popularity, the kamishibai, which when translated means paper plays. These plays featured a small paper stage which could be fitted on the back of a bicycle, and upon this stage, the narrator would use small cards on the ends of sticks with illustrations of characters to play out stories intended to enthrall and inspire children. These cards would have a character in one pose on the front and another pose on the back, so that, for example, a warrior might be in a resting pose or a fighting pose simply by turning the card. Dr. Tara M. McGowan, in her essay The Many Faces of Kamishibai, describes the plays. Quote, Virtuous adolescent heroes typically are called upon to save the world from adult corruption or, alternatively, futuristic threats from alien monsters. Kamishibai artists culled inspiration from every imaginable source, including Japanese folk legends about shape-shifting foxes, samurai warriors and ninjas, and Western classics like Peter Pan and Frankenstein." Unquote. But the largest contributing factor to its popularity, perhaps, was how cheap it was to produce. Bicycles were already prolific, and the equipment for the paper plays was cheap, meaning that these traveling narrators could go to work on the streets and in the neighborhoods with little extra effort or money, bringing smiles and laughs to children against the backdrop of death and destruction. But these kamishibai weren't the only entertainment in Japan after the war. Culture and art was spreading to Japan from America in part through the occupying soldiers, and one of the most popular imports was the animation work of Disney Studios. Disney was already a popular phenomenon in Japan before the war, partially because it was cheaper to import animation from America rather than produce any in Japan, which had few experts. Disney's influences, down to the racist caricatures, can even be seen in Japanese animation produced during World War II. With little cultural advancement in Japan, American culture began imposing itself. Soon, all of these influences would come together in a single narrative that would find popularity with Japanese audiences and beyond. In 1951, the imposing American and traditional Japanese traditions collided in a comic called Tetsuan Otomu, or Mighty Atom. After the war, comics and other two-dimensional media had seen a revival, and Mighty Atom quickly found popularity among the audiences of Japan, but the tone of the comic was far more positive and comedic than one would expect from a country so ravaged by warfare and the nuclear age. The eponymous main character is a robot created in the likeness of a young boy who died in an automatic car accident. The boy's father, the leader of a research institution, went mad with grief and poured all of the institute's resources into creating a lifelike robot. This robot then decides he wants to become a hero, helping and protecting all of humanity and robot kind. This comedic style was a common feature of the media landscape. Historians often suggest that this was a way to escape the horrifying memory of nuclear fire. What's most notable about this character is the inclusion of nuclear power as his heart. It would be reasonable to assume that the Japanese would come to associate nuclear power with death and destruction, fear and anger, and they did, but they also seemed to see it pragmatically as a tool that could be used for good. This comic was done in a comic strip style known as manga, which resembled in many ways the rounded caricatures of Disney cartoons from the West. These manga were typically light-hearted and told humorous stories of everyday life, but Mighty Adam co-opted this style to tell a slightly more sophisticated story. It was so popular that Dark Horse Comics acquired the license to Mighty Adam and translated it for American audiences, localizing it as most Americans know it today, Astro Boy. In 1953, just two years after Mighty Adam's publication in Japan, the television was introduced to the country. 
Before the war, in 1926, the Japanese had experimented with television technology and in 1939, television broadcasts began, but only a few months after its implementation, World War II began and all available resources were given over to military purposes. This time, however, thanks to a rekindled and repairing economy, its use spread quickly. Thomas Havens, in his book Artist and Patron in Postwar Japan, explains that, quote, the economy regained its pre-war level of output in 1955 and began to grow, almost without pause, at an average rate in real terms of 11% a year until the world oil crisis in 1973." Unquote. Chief among all programming, everyone wanted to watch Disney. At this point, much of the television programming came from America, where the infrastructure was already in place to create vast kinds and quantities of entertainment. The people of Japan took to calling these television sets electric kamishibai, since the size of television screens at the time were about the same size as the kamishibai stages on the backs of bicycles. Despite the demand for American film and television programming, the aspiring Japanese filmmakers would not be daunted, and one of the hallmarks of Japanese cinema was released in 1954, Gojira, better known in the West as Godzilla. This narrative seemed to serve as a counterpoint to the mighty Atom comics, and Gojira himself seemed to be the embodiment of the destructive potential of nuclear weapons which could only be stopped by complete disintegration. Though live-action filmmaking already had some infrastructure behind it, there was no such advantage for animation. Scarce few animations were created before the war, and most of those created were lost. Animation during the war was sponsored entirely by the state and created for propaganda, and with the collapse of the state, animation studios had to be pieced back together. Simply starting a studio at this time seemed a pointless endeavor because of the demand for Disney cartoons. They had the resources, the infrastructure, and the talent to create consistently amazing work. It wasn't until 1956 that a studio attempted to challenge the dominion of Disney in Japan, but the effort was a Herculean one. Toeiko was a Japanese film studio whose goals were lofty, announcing from the beginning the desire to become, quote, the Disney of the East. Their first work would be a massive undertaking, utilizing celluloid animation tools, the same kinds of tools used by Disney to craft gorgeous, intricate scenes. They even attempted to invoke Disney's storytelling style by adapting an old legend, though this one was from China. The result was a film entitled The Tale of the White Serpent, released in 1958. At 78 minutes long, the film was of unprecedented quality, animated in full color, and even received an honor at the Venice Children's Film Festival. America, however, seemed to regard it as a lackluster Disney release, but this seemed to matter little for the progression of animation in Japan, which had just received its first feature-length animated film made for Japanese audiences by a Japanese animation studio. Jerry Beck, a historian and professor at California Institute of the Arts, goes as far as saying that, quote, the Japanese animation industry arguably began when the live-action Toei Co. founded its Toei Animation Co. subsidiary. It wasn't long until animation made the move from movie screens to television screens. In 1963, the first fully animated television shows were released, and the lineup featured a familiar face, Mighty Atom. To animate it, manga artists were pulled from their usual line of work, and to cut costs, the series used a style called limited animation, where frame rates are much lower, often lower than half, of the standard 24 frames per second. Along with this, the animators would often use the same frame of animation for many frames in a row, sliding it across the screen to suggest movement. Mouth animations were also very limited, and sometimes a speaking character was denoted simply by having their mouth remain open. Still, the show enchanted its audiences, and quickly this television version of Mighty Atom became a hit. One of the likely contributing factors was how similar it was in many ways to the Kamishibai, the subject matter and tone was very similar, and the cartoonish style was reminiscent of the style of characters on the paper cards. The show saw popularity with children and adults alike, and much like manga in general, appealed to males ages 30 and below. It continued for years, with new episodes being produced regularly, but nobody could guess just how popular the show would become and what it would lead to overseas. Later that year, Mighty Atom was discovered by an American film executive. 
Fred Ladd, in his book Astro Boy and Anime Come to the Americas, describes that fateful moment. Quote, At the time, NBC had a representative in Tokyo who was sitting in his hotel room one day watching TV when, suddenly, he saw a new cartoon character performing incredible feats of strength, incredible even by cartoon standards. The rep thought, what the heck is that? He didn't recognize the little robot character with the funny hat and rockets in his boots. Since there was no TV animation coming from Japan in those days, he thought that, because of its extremely limited animation, the new show must be something out of Hanna-Barbera Studios in Hollywood." Unquote. After some negotiation, a deal was struck, and Mighty Atom found its way onto American airwaves, adopting the name Astro Boy from the localized manga. The show quickly gained traction and popularity. For the first time, instead of a popular piece of media moving from America to Japan, it was the other way around. In all, the show had a three-year run, with a total of 193 original episodes. Though manga and anime began as a style of media directed chiefly towards young males, it quickly saw experimentation with other audiences. Shows like Sally the Witch pushed the style to young women, while late-night shows were created for more adult audiences. This manga style came to be known for its implementation on the page as well as on the screen, and it was found appealing not just in Japan, but abroad as well, and eventually found its way into every corner of the globe, even South Africa. Different anime discovered popularity in different places, and the reasons for certain shows and movies' popularity wasn't always immediately evident. But it wasn't until the late 1960s and 70s that anime saw the foundation laid for it to become a true global juggernaut. During the 60s, manga's popularity was increasing along with the disposable income of its audience, and it was around this time that one of the foundational manga publications would begin printing. Weekly Shonen Jump began in 1968, the word shonen meaning boy. Predictably, these manga were aimed at boys ages 18 and below, and were typically full of action-packed stories. This genre borrowed most of its story traits from the old kamishibai, being action-packed tales of heroic warriors, always males and usually young, with suspenseful story arcs. Also similar to the kamishibai, they would draw from nearly any source, and many of the same stories told in the paper theater were put on the pages of manga with fantastical embellishments and exciting combat. Science fiction was a favorite topic. But manga also began to expand to incorporate women in their audience as well, and to this end, another style was created that developed at the same time, shoujo, which translates approximately to girl as a counterpart to shonen. While shonen featured mostly male casts of characters, shoujo would chiefly feature women in the leading roles. Tales of deep, emotional romance and magical girls dominated this style, and were usually written and drawn by women. Up to this point, any girl-oriented manga had typically been drawn by men. Eventually, publishing companies specifically focusing on shoujo manga would appear, such as Clamp. Over time, the manga style moved farther and farther away from Disney's style, and took on a character of its own, becoming distinctly Japanese with fewer bulbous, rounded lines and more defined, realistic bodies. But the fastest growing medium for this style of art was the television series, which was quickly overtaking feature-length anime movies. Of note was the show Heidi, Girl of the Alps, released in 1974, which stood out amidst its contemporaries as distinctly different from either shonen or shoujo. Instead, it was targeted at very young children. It focuses on the daily life of a child named Heidi living with her family in the Swiss Alps. The series lasted for a year, with 52 original episodes created for it. This show's story and visual design may look familiar to some who have never seen it before, with good reason. Among the crew working on the project was the animator Hayao Miyazaki. This show, which saw great popularity both domestically and abroad, would lay the groundwork for the rush of popularity that was yet to come. Back in Japan, however, a decentralized phenomenon would soon begin that nobody could have predicted, and soon it would become intrinsically intertwined with this newly popular style and, eventually, guide it. <laughs> 